everyone. Um, this is going to start the second session on choice modeling uh, with Hossein uh, Toparoglu from Cornell. Um, the next session is the third session and the last one from this short course, and that's going to happen on Monday. Following that will be a seminar live uh, session given by uh, Gustavo Vulcano from Ditella, and that will be next week. All right, uh, have a great session, um, everyone. Same, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Victor. <clears throat> okay, so let me share my screen. Good. And uh, thanks again for making the time for the second session. Um, as we go along again, like we did in the previous session, please, if you have a question, just jump in and interrupt and ask. And when I'm sharing screens, sometimes I don't get to see the uh, videos uh, on my screen. So again, please jump ahead and interrupt me. And if that's not a good point to ask a question, I have no problem saying that. Please give me another two minutes to finish what I'm talking about. But please do not hesitate to interrupt me. Let's try to make this as interactive as possible. Okay, so what did we do in the uh, last session, in the previous session? In the previous session, we talked about random utility maximization principle as a way of modeling the choice behavior of the customers. And by using these generalized extreme value distribution for the random utilities, we obtained this whole broad class of choice models called the generalized extreme value models. And the multinomial logit and the nested logit models were two instances of the generalized extreme value models. And now we studied those format optimization problems under the multinomial logit model and the nested logit model. So that's what we did. So today we're going to study assortment optimization problems under another choice model called the uh, Markov chain choice model. Here again, we're going to study the standard static assortment optimization problem. And what I mean by the standard assortment optimization problem is that the firm is going to have a universal products. Within this universe, the firm is going to choose an assortment to offer to you. Are thinking about, and after that, we're going to start thinking about um, assortment optimization problems with some inventory considerations. So we're now going to look at offering assortments for multiple customers over time. And now we're going to have limited inventories for the products and the assortments that we can offer to our customers are going to be limited by the inventory availabilities. Okay, so let's get started. So let's, let's, let's see what the outline for today is going to be. First, we're going to talk about what this Marco chain business, Marco chain choice model looks like. And then we're going to talk about how to solve the assortment optimization problems under the Marco chain choice model. And after that, we're going to look at revenue management problems over a network of resources. So in this setup, we're going to have multiple resources with limited inventories. Customers are going to come in. To each arriving customer, we're going to offer an assortment of products. The customers are going to choose within the assortment of products that we offer according to our choice model. And the sale of a resource is going to sale of a product is going to consume a combination of resources. And now our assortment decisions are going to be limited by the inventory availabilities of the resources. So we're going to look at a simple linear programming approximation for that kind of a problem. That linear program happens to have a very special structure under the Markov chain choice model. And we're going to see a nice structure of that linear program under the Markov chain choice model. And lastly, in today, we're going to look at single resource revenue management problems. Um, where our ability to offer assortments is limited by the availability of single re availability of a single resource. And again, considering the case where the customers are choosing according to the Marco chain choice model, we're going to give a nice characterization of the, of the optimal policy in that setting. All right, so let's start by talking about what the Marco chain choice model looks like, and let's start talking about assortment optimization problems under the Marco chain choice model. So again, here our focus is going to be on the classical assortment optimization problem, just like the problem that we talked about in the previous session. The firm has access to a universe of products. Each one of these white boxes is a product that the firm can offer to its customers. There is also the no purchase option. Within this universe, the firm is going to decide which assortment of products to offer to its customers. We offer this product, this one, this one, and that one. And the customers are going to come in. They're going to make a choice within the offered assortment or decide to leave without the system without purchasing anything. But today the choice of the customers are going to be governed by this Marco chain choice model. 
And the goal of the firm, again, is going to be which assortment of products should it be offering to its customers so it maximizes the expected revenue from a customer, basically. So that's going to be the general setup, at least in the first one, 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 one third of the uh, lecture today. So then let me tell you what this Markov chain choice model is. So let me tell you how this Markov chain choice model is going to work. So let's index the products by the integers from one to n. Once the firm decides which assortment of products to offer to its customers, here's how the customer's choice behavior is going to work under this Markov chain choice model. With probability lambda i, when a customer arrives into the system, she's going to be interested in product i. So she's going to check whether product i is available. She's going to be interested in product i. If product i is available, then the customer is going to make the purchase for product i. She's going to leave the system. The choice process is over. If the product i is not available, like in this picture, the customer is going to transition from product i to product j according to some transition probability rho i j, and then she's going to check the availability of product j. If product j is available, then the customer is going to make a uh, is going to make the purchase for product j. Trans uh, the choice probability is over. If product J is not available, then the customer is going to transition from product J to some other product K. And as these transitions are happening, the customer can also transition into the no purchase option as well. Okay. So then as these transitions are happening, if the customer hits an available product before she hits the no purchase option, then she's going to make the purchase and leave the system. She's going to purchase that product and leave the system. But as these transitions are happening, if the customer first hits the no purchase option before hitting an available product, then the customer is going to leave the system without purchasing anything. So this is how the Markov chain choice model is going to work. Okay. So then to repeat, uh, there is an initial there are initial arrival probabilities lambda i. So when a customer arrives into the system, she's going to be interested in purchasing product i when she arrives into the system. She's going to check the availability of product i. If product is available, she's going to purchase it. Story is over. If product I is not available, she's going to transition from product I to product J with some transition probability. She can also transition to the no purchase option. So when she transitions into some other product J, she's going to check the availability of product J. If product J is available, then she's going to purchase that one. If product J is not available, then she's going to transition from product J to some other product K with some transition probability, rho JK. Again, she can transition into the no purchase option as well from product J. If she transitions from product J to product K, then she's going to check the availability of product K. In this picture, product K is available. She would purchase the product K, and that will be the end of the choice process. So as the customer is transitioning between the products and the no purchase option, if she hits a available product first before hitting the no purchase option, she's going to purchase that product. If she hits a no purchase option, if she hits the no purchase option before hitting an available product, then she's going to leave the system without purchasing it. So this is what the Marco chain choice model is. So then what are the parameters of our Markov chain choice model? These lambda i's, these are the probabilities that the customer is going to arrive into the system with an interest in each product i, and these transition probabilities, rho i j's. The probability that the customer transitions from product i to product j if she finds product i not available. So these are the parameters of this Markov chain choice model. And <clears throat> if the customer is visiting product j, if the customer is visiting product j, and product J is not available, then the customer is going to transition from product J to the no purchase option with one minus the total transition probability out of product J. Okay, so this is gonna, this row J0 is going to be the transition probability from product J to the no purchase option that is given by one minus the total transition probability out of product J to any of the products. And this set N is the set of our products, it's the integers from one to N. So that is the Markov chain choice model. So let me take a breather here and see whether there is anybody, any questions, any comments about how the Markov chain choice model works. Uh, hi, I had a question over here. Yes. Yeah, so uh, does this imply that the consumer already knows what product is it looking for? Because if it is a store visit, the consumer may not exactly know which one is it going to yeah. purchase. It may have a brief idea, but not a concrete idea. Yeah. So don't interpret this as as don't interpret this as as what's going on in people's minds. Okay. So it's not like the customers are jumping over different products to make their customers' choices. Think of it like I wanna I wanna I wanna choose these transition probabilities and the initial arrival probabilities such that. Out of this choice process, the probability that the customer chooses each product is going to reflect what I observed in the data. So then don't think of this, don't think of this model as a structural choice model 
where we're trying to exactly replicate the thinking process or the true choice process for customer, the mechanics of the choice process. This is a mathematical construction. And ultimately, all, I'm, all I care about is I want to calibrate the parameters of my choice model, these transition probabilities and these initial arrival probabilities, so that if I offer a certain assortment, the probability that a certain product is going to be chosen out of that assortment is going to reflect, is going to match what I'm observing in, in reality. Okay. So then don't, don't think of it like, oh, when a customer is making a choice, she's jumping from one product to another. I think that's a, that's a better way to justify this model. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. My question was related. Uh, so has there been any attempt to explain the model in behavioral terms? Um, as far as I know, I don't. And there are, and it's not easy, it's not hard to poke holes at this model when you think about it behavioral terms. Um, for example, here I can visit a non-available product, uh, an unavailable product twice. Right? There's nothing that prevent me, prevents me to visit product I twice. So I think it is, it is hard to justify uh, this model uh, from, from a behavioral perspective. May, like just one thought, maybe the, the reason why it works reasonably well is because it, uh, it kind of considers what people didn't buy more carefully. Uh, so the, uh, the, can you say more about that a little bit more? So the products that are not available could be visited by someone before, um, could be considered or visited uh, before they make their final choice. So in a way, uh, the outside option is more carefully modeled here. At least, at least that's my uh, rough interpretation of the market chain choice model. You know, until it hits one of the products that's available, uh, the consumer visits the products that are not available. And in regular choice models, that uh, you ignore that. Right? Any any kind of other steps, uh, other products that people may, may have considered. I see your point. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I see. Again, I don't have much to say other than what you said, honestly, to be honest. Great, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so this is how our choice model is going to work. So then the first thing we're going to do is, what are the choice probabilities under the Markov chain choice model? So namely, you know, when we're working with any choice model, the one of the first things that we're interested in is, given that we offer a certain assortment SO products, a certain subset SO products, what is the probability that the customer is going to choose product J? What is the choice probabilities that is arising from this Markov chain choice model? So that is the first thing we're going to do. So let's define two numbers here, PJ of S, PJ of S, and PJ of S is the following. Given that we offer the subset S of products, PJ of S is the probability that the customers visit product J during the choice of her choice process and purchases it. Let me say it again. Given that we offer the assortment S subset SO products, PG of S is the probability that the customer visits product J during the course of her choice process and purchases it. And likewise, RG of S is going to be, given that we offer the subset SO products, RG of S is the probability that a customer visits product J during the course of her choice process and does not purchase it because the product J is not available. Okay, so then PG of S is the probability that the customer per visits product J during the course of her choice process and purchases it. And RG of S is the probability that the customer visits product J during the course of her choice process and does not purchase it as a function of the assortment that we offer. So then we're going to write a system of linear equations that should be satisfied by PG of S's and RG of S's. Here is that system of linear equations. Let's run through what the system of linear equations say. <clears throat> Given that we offer the assortment SO products, this is the probable to that customer visits product J during the course of her choice process and purchases it. This is the probable that the customer visits product J during the course of her choice process and does not purchase it. So the sum over here, it's the probable to that the customer visits product J during the course of her choice process, given that we offer the assortment S. This is the visit and purchase. This is the visit and don't purchase probability. So the sum is going to be the probable that the customer visits product J during the course of her choice process. That is it. For a customer to visit product J, she should, she, she should either arrive with the intention of purchasing product J, or she should visit some other, some product I during the course of her choice process, not purchase it, which happens with this probability, and then transition from product I to product J, 
Okay, so this is some kind of a flow balance equation that should be satisfied by these PJ and RIJ values. Again, this is the probability that the customer visits product J during the course of her choice process and purchases it. This is the probability that she visits and does not purchase it. Then the sum is the total probability that the customer visits product J during the course of her choice process, given that we offer the assortment S. So then for a customer to visit product J, she should either arrive to purchase product J or she should visit some product I not purchase it and then transition from product I to product J. Okay, so this is some kind of a balance equations that should be satisfied for all, uh, all PJs and RJ. So I have this equation for every J that is a product. And I have some boundary conditions. This one says the following, if product J is not offered, if product J is not offered, then the probability that the customer visits product J and purchases it is zero. If product J is not offered, the customer can never purchase product J. And if product J is offered, then the probability that the customer visits product J and does not purchase it is zero because if the product J is offered, whenever the customer visits product J, she's always going to purchase the product. Okay. So now let's think about how many equations do I have here and how many unknowns do I have? In terms of the unknowns, I have N unknowns from the PJ side and I have N unknowns from the RJ side. So there are two n unknowns that I'm trying to get at. Let's count the number of equations that we have. From the first set of equations, I have n equations. From the second, second set of equations, I have one equation that is for every j that is not in the set S. So the number of equations that I have here, n minus the cardinality S. And the number of equations that I have here is exactly the cardinality of S. So the total number of equations that I have here is 2n. So I have two n equations two and unknowns, I can solve the system of equations to get these PG of S's and RG of S's. And once I solve the system of equations, PG of S is going to be the probable to that a customer purchases product J, given that we offer the assortment S of products. Okay? So the upshot of this discussion is that under the Markov chain choice model, given that we offer any assortment S, the choice probability of the products can be computed by solving a system of linear equations. Okay, this is somewhat like, somewhat unlike the multinomial logic model. Under the multinomial logic model, we had a closed form expression for the choice probabilities. Give me the assortment. I can immediately tell you the. I can immediately tell you the choice probability of each product. Here, to be able to just compute the choice probability of each product for a given assortment, I need to solve a system of linear equations. Okay, so that's how the Markov chain choice model works. So now. <clears throat> We know how to compute the choice probabilities under the Markov chain choice model. The next thing we're going to think about, the next thing we're going to think about, uh, how do I solve the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model? Yes, please. Can I ask a, a question about terminology? So when you say a customer considers, it means that their initial, uh, initial, initially uh, under the system wanting to uh, purchase J or that the Markov chain that governs the transitions traverses over state J at least once. So what is the main? The latter one, the latter one. So, so, so okay. uh, and uh, what, what my wording, what I said in English was different than what's in the slide. And I think a better way to do this is the following, visits product J. So let's say that definition of PJS okay. and RGFS one more time. PJS is given that we offer the subset SO products, PJS is the problem that the customer visits product J and purchases it during the course of her choice process, okay? So she visits, she lands in product J. And likewise, RJS is the, uh, I apologize, my writing on the slide wasn't uh, very good. That's why I tried to change it when I was going over the slide in English. Visits is a better way to put it. And I think this clarifies it now, it seems like. Uh, I see, okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, okay, good. So now, so now uh, <clears throat> we know that I can compute the choice probabilities under the Markov chain choice model by solving a system of equations. So now let's think about formulating our assortment optimization problem. Let's say RG is the revenue associated with product J. So this is how much money we make if we sell one unit of product J. So then try my assortment optimization problem. If you offer the assortment SO products, this is the probable to that a customer is going to purchase product J. If she purchases product J, this is the revenue that we collect at overall products. This is the expected revenue that we obtain when we offer the assortment SO products. And I'm trying to find a subset SO products to offer so that we maximize the expected revenue from a customer's visit. So this is the assortment optimization problem that I would like to solve, okay? 
And when we write the problem in this fashion, just compute, forget optimization, forget optimization, just computing the objective value at a fixed assortment is not easy because computing this guy requires a computing this choice probability requires a system of solving a system of linear equations. So this seems to make it look like this seems to make it look like the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model is hard because again, as I said, just computing the objective function, just computing this guy for a fixed assortment requires solving a system of equations. But it turns out, if you look at the problem in a slightly different fashion, solving the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model is going to be uh, super tractable. And here is the different way of looking at the problem. So what we're going to do is, <clears throat> let's let VJBD, let's let VJBD, VJBD, optimally expect the revenue from a customer who arrived into the system with the intention of purchasing product check. Okay? So let's let VJBD, optimally expect the revenue from a customer who arrives into the system with the intention of purchasing product check. So now we're going to try some kind of a dynamic programming equation that needs to be satisfied by VJs. Namely, this is the optimally expected revenue from a customer that arrives into the system with the intention of purchasing product check. If I offer product check, then the customer is going to purchase that product, the car, then I'm gonna make a revenue of RJ from that customer, that is it. If I do not offer product check, then the customer is going to transition from product J to product I with this probability. At that point, the customer is almost like a customer who arrived into the system fresh with an interest in product I. And the optimal expected revenue from that customer is VI. So add over all I's. So this is the optimal expected revenue that I obtained from a customer who arrived into the system with the intention of purchasing product J. If product J is not available, in that case, the customer is going to transition from product J to product I. And at that point, it's a customer who essentially arrived fresh with an interest in product I. So if this side is larger than this side, it's optimal to offer product J. If this side is larger than that side, then it's optimal not to offer product J. So this is the kind of Bauman equation that you should be said should be satisfied by VJs. So if I can find VJs that satisfies this Bauman equation, if I can find VJs that satisfy this Bauman equation, then I can check if this is larger than this, then it's optimal to offer product J. If this right-hand side is larger than the left-hand side, then it's optimal not to offer product chain. So then we can solve the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model by using this kind of a dynamic programming uh, kind of an argument. And if you compute VJs that satisfy this Bellman equation, then the optimal assortment is given by, as we said, look at all the products such that, look at all the products J, such that this left side in the Bellman equation is greater or equal to the right-hand side. Those are the products that are optimal to offer in the optimal assortment. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, if I again compute VJs that satisfy this Bellman equation, <clears throat> what is the optimal expected revenue from a customer? Well, this is the probability that a customer arrives into the system with an interest in product J. And this is the optimal expected revenue from a customer who arrives into the system with an interest in product J. And overall customers, this is gonna be the optimal expected revenue from a customer. Okay, so this essentially almost gives us a full solution for the uh, assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model. Find VJs that solve the Spalman equation. If this side is RJ is greater than the right hand side in the Bellman equation, offer product J, otherwise do not offer product J. That's all there is to it. Okay, and let me say you let me say one last thing. How do I find VJs that satisfies this system of equations? How do I find VJs that satisfy this Bellman equation? One way to do that is to, solve a, is to solve a linear program. Here's what that linear program looks like. I want Vj to be the maximum of Rj and this sum. So in my constraints in my linear program, I'm going to put two constraints. Vj is greater than or equal to Rj, and Vj is greater than or equal to the expected revenue from a customer if I let the customer transition out of product J. So I said Vj is greater than or equal to this side, and also Vj is greater than or equal to that side in my constraints. And on top of that, in the objective function, <clears throat> I'm going to minimize the sum of uh, the, if you like, the optimal expected revenue from a customer, lambda times lambda j times vj's. And I'm going to minimize this objective function. So if you try to minimize that objective function, what is going to happen? We're going to try to push these vj's as small as possible. If we try to push vj's as small as possible, vj is going to get stuck at the maximum of rj and this sum. So when I solve this linear program, Vg is going to be exactly equal to the maximum of Rj and this sum. So by solving this linear program, I'm going to be able to get the Vjs that satisfy the Bellman equations that's on the top. On top of that, 
since Vjs are going to be the values of Vjs that satisfy this Bellman equation, the optimal objective value of this linear program is also going to correspond to exactly the optimal expected revenue from a customer. So the ob objective value of this linear program is also going to automatically return the optimal expected revenue from a customer in my Markov chain choice model. Okay, so now done. We know how to solve the Markov chain choice models assortment optimization problem. Let me again take another uh, pause point. And I'm also checking some of the uh, discussion that went on in chat. So just to make sure that I'm not missing any questions. Okay, let me take another pause point and sure. see anybody has any comments or questions. So, so just to understand uh, the trade-offs here, um, you want to choose, in a sense, you want to choose an assortment that will um, that will balance the uh, uh, the the probability that at the end the the the, uh, the customer will not purchase anything, but on the other hand, not to offer them. Uh, the low revenue, uh, the too many low revenue options. That's is exactly that... what it is, and and that is the okay. that is the trade off that's prevalent in all the assortment optimization problems that we talked about last time, and also here as well. Right? If you offer too few products, then the customer may go to the no purchase option. You lost the customer. If you offer too many products, then that may require offering uh, low revenue products. Then if the customer hits that, you're you're making uh, bad revenue. That's precisely the trade off. Here, multinomial logit, nested logit, this is the fundamental trade off. Exactly. Exactly. Great. Great. Thanks. That's a good point. Uh, that's good to emphasize. Anybody? Anything else? Good. Okay. This linear program is going to come handy. So let's try to make sure that we register the linear, linear program. So this is the linear program that we need to solve whenever we need to solve the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model with these revenues, with these transition probabilities, and with these initial arrival probabilities. So then I'm going to show you a few structural results for the assortment optimization problem and the choice probabilities under the Markov chain choice model. Especially this structural result that we're going to look at is going to feel a little bit more, a little bit unmotivated right now. But later on in the talk, you're going to see exactly the motivation, exactly why we need this model, why we need this structural result. But nevertheless, let's go ahead and so show the structural result. It's going to help us to maybe relax our muscles, flex our muscles a little bit. Uh, but also the structural result is going to be very handy later on in the talk. Here is a structural result that I would like to show. We're going to show that if the revenue of each product increases by the same constant, then the optimal assortment in our Markov chain choice model assortment optimization problem, the optimal assortment becomes a larger assortment. This is the structural result that I want to show. Again, it feels unmotivated right now, but you're going to exactly see uh, why we need this structural result later on in the talk when we talk about assortment optimization problems with inventories. So, okay, the result that we want to show is if the revenue of each product increases by the same amount, same constant, then the optimal assortment becomes a larger assortment. Let me try to tell you exactly what we're trying to show. Okay. Here is the assortment optimization problem. Here is the assortment optimization problem under our Markov chain choice model. When we increase the revenue of each product by the amount delta, when the revenue of each product is increased by the amount delta, let's call that optimal assortment as S delta. So S delta is the optimal assortment when the revenue of each product is increased by delta, okay? So now we know that in order to compute S delta, I need to solve this kind of a Bellman equation. So let's say Vj delta is the optimal expected revenue from a customer who's arriving with the intention of purchasing product J when the revenue of each product is increased by delta. So to compute these Vj deltas, I need to solve this kind of a uh, Bellman equation. Then we know that once I solve this Bellman equation, the optimal assortment when the revenue of each product is increased by delta is obtained by, if this guy is larger than this guy, then it's optimal to offer product J. If this guy is larger than the other one, then it's optimal not to offer product J. So once we compute these VJ deltas, the optimal assortment that we have when the revenue of each product is increased by delta is given by this expression. So these are things that we already know. So what we want to prove is the following. If we increase the revenue associated with each product by an amount delta, the optimal assortment is larger when compared with the case when we don't increase the revenues at all. So that's the result that I want to prove. Okay. Why do I want to prove this? It's going to be useful later on in the talk. So let's just let's let me not try to motivate this more than that. Okay. So that's the result that we would like to prove. When we increase the revenue of each product by an amount delta, the optimal assortment is going to be a larger assortment 
when compared with the case when we do not increase the revenues of the products by that. Okay, so that's what we're going to prove. So we're going to start with a pretty intuitive observation. Here is the intuitive observation we're going to start with, right there. And what is that? <clears throat> this is remember the optimal expected revenue from a customer who arrives into the system to purchase product J, given that I increase the revenue of each product by the amount delta. This is the optimal expected revenue from a customer who arrives into the system with the intention to purchase product J when the revenues are not increased at all. Of course, this optimal expected revenue is going to be larger than this optimal expected revenue because over here, I increase the revenues of each product by an amount delta. Over here, I do not increase anything. So the optimal expected revenue from a customer who arrives into purchase product G is going to be larger when I increase the revenue of each product by an amount uh, delta. So this inequality is trivial. Okay. On the other hand, if you look at this inequality, if you look at this inequality, when I increase the revenue of each product by an amount delta, the optimal expected revenue cannot increase by more than amount delta. Why is that? If a customer comes in and makes a purchase with probability one, when I increase the revenue of each product by an amount delta, then the optimal expected revenue from that customer is going to increase exactly by delta. But the customer is not necessarily going to make a purchase with probability one. There's a probability that I'm going to lose that customer. So then when I increase the revenue of each product by an amount delta, the optimal expected revenue from a customer cannot increase by more than amount delta. So this is why the second inequality holds. I mean, giving you a, I'm giving you a justification for the second inequality by using an intuitive argument, if you will. But you can also mathematically, algebraically prove this inequality as well. But let me not prove that inequality algebraically. I'm going to hope that my intuitive reasoning is good enough. And I'm going to hope that you believe my intuitive reasoning. But you can algebraically prove this inequality as well. So let me again say what, we, what this inequality is saying. This is the optimal expected revenue when, when we increase the this is the optimal expected revenue from a customer who arrives into product J when we increase the revenue of each product by delta. When we increase the revenue of each product by delta, the optimal expected revenue from a customer cannot increase by more than delta because if the, product, if the customer made a purchase with exact probability one, then the optimal expected revenue from that customer would have increased by delta, but the customer is not necessarily going to make a purchase with probability one. Okay, so now let's put this relationship in our pocket and let's get to the result that we want to prove. We want to prove this inequality. We want to prove this inclusion property. Here's how we're going to prove this inclusion property. <clears throat> Good. <clears throat> Remember, this is the optimal, optimal assortment. When I increase the revenue of each product by delta, it's given by this expression. If the first term in the Bellman equation is greater than the last term, then it's optimal to offer that product. Otherwise, it's not optimal to offer that product. So this is the definition of the optimal assortment when I increase the revenue of each product by an amount delta. What we showed in the previous panel was that this quantity, this quantity is upper bounded by this quantity. This quantity is upper bounded by this quantity. Where is that? This quantity is upper bounded by this quantity. Let's come back. This quantity is upper bounded by this quantity. So if I replace this guy by something larger, I made right-hand side of this inequality by larger. So I made this inequality harder to satisfy. As a result, this set is going to be a smaller set. So I made this inequality more restrictive. So as a result, this set became a smaller set. Okay, good. The next thing I'm going to do is, the next thing I'm going to do is, I'm going to distribute this rho ji over this term, and I'm going to distribute this rho j over this term. If I distribute rho j over this term, that's what I obtain. I'm going to, if I distribute rho j over this term, what is that going to give me? Delta times the total transition probability out of product j, Delta times the total transition probability out of product J. And the total transition probability out of J is going to be less than or equal to one because I can also go to the no purchase option. So this sum is less than or equal to one. If I replace this sum by one, I made the right hand side of this inequality even larger. So I made this inequality even stringier, which makes which may which 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 says that this this uh, this inequality is going to be even harder to satisfy. As a result, this subset is going to get even smaller. Cancel the deltas, we get exactly what's over here. And this is exactly the optimal assortment when the revenues of the products are not increased by delta at all. So now from these three or four panels, what we get is that the optimal assortment when the revenue of each product has been increased by delta is a larger assortment when compared with the case when the revenues are not increased at all. Okay, again, this result is going to come handy when we think about uh, inventory the assortment optimization problem. So let's put it in our pocket. And we're gonna move on. But let me again take another pause here. Uh, questions, comments, clarifications. 
so going back to the my previous question uh would the intuition here be uh that when you increase the value for a product then um you lose more by uh, by forcing the the customer to go to the no purchase option and therefore you would like to increase your uh menu of uh, options yeah yeah and yeah 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 and you know the way i think about this result is if delta is super large right if delta is super 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 large then our eyes are essentially disappearing so the revenues are being dominated by delta so now we have a situation where all of the products have super large revenues then why the hell not let's offer everything so that's that's my way of thinking but essentially we're speaking the same language here. exactly great thanks good let's put this result uh, in our pocket i have yes, one please. question uh this subset delta is not strictly smaller than this subset zero so to call it right it could be uh, i'm not sure i can say it one more time yeah uh this s delta is not yes. strictly smaller than s -0. yes yes it, so this is my be... oh yes this is this is i mean yes yeah yes. okay okay no yeah, yes absolutely you. absolutely and Yes. Okay. So that's one structural property. Another interesting, and I think this is a cute thing, is that you know we cooked up this Markov chain choice model. Let's try try to provide a little bit more justification for it. And one justification we can provide for this multinomial logic uh, Markov chain choice model is that one justification for this Markov chain choice model is that it turns out the multinomial logit model, our good or multinomial logit model is a special case of the Markov chain choice model. So the Markov chain choice model is a more general choice model than the multinomial logic model. So there is a there is a relationship actually to the multinomial logic model. So this Markov chain choice model is a more general version of the multinomial logic model. So multinomial logic model is a special case of the Markov chain choice model. And let's try to understand why and how. OK, so let's remember how the multinomial logic model works. Let's consider the multinomial logic model where the preference weight of product J is VJ. So let's consider the MMR code multinomial logit model, where the preference weight of the product J is VJ. So then under the multinomial logit model, we talked about last time, if you offer the subset S of products, the probability that customer purchases product J is given by the preference weight of product J divided by the preference weight of all available options. And the preference weight of all available options being the preference weights of all the products in the offered assortment and the preference weight of the no purchase option. Here, we normalize the preference weight of the no purchase option to one. So these are the choice probabilities under the multinomial logic model. Okay. It turns out that, it turns out that interestingly, give me a multinomial logic model. I can calibrate the parameters of the Markov chain choice model such that the choice probabilities under my Markov chain choice model exactly match the choice probabilities under the multinomial logic model for any assortment for any product. Okay. So give me any multinomial logic model. I can calibrate the parameters of the Markov chain choice model such that the choice probabilities under the Markov chain choice model is going to be exactly equal to those under the multinomial logic model. Okay. So as a result, I can always, you know, mold my Markov chain choice model into a multinomial logic model. As a result, my multinomial logic model is a special case of the Markov chain choice model. So then let's show this result. Let's argue this result. Okay. So what I want to show is that give me any Markov, any multinomial logic model. I can calibrate the parameters of my Markov chain choice model such that my Markov chain choice model produces produce the same choice probabilities. Here's that. So give me a Markov multinomial logic model. Give me a multinomial logic model with preference weights VJ. Give me a multinomial logic model with preference weights VJ. I'm going to construct the Markov chain choice model with these initial prior arrival probabilities and with these transition probabilities. So my initial prior arrival probabilities are preference weight of product one, product I, the initial arrival probability at product I is the preference weight of product I divided by one plus the total preference weight of all available options. So this is my notation. Let me clarify my notation. When I write V of S, read that as the total preference weights of the products in assortment S, okay? So now give me any Markov, give me any multinomial logic model with preference weights VJ. I'm going to construct the corresponding Markov chain choice model where the initial arrival probability for product I is given by preference weight of product I divided by the preference weight of everything, all products. 
And also the transition probability from product I to product G is preference weight of product J divided by the preference weight of everything as well. We're gonna be able to show that if I calibrate my Markov chain choice model in this way, then for my Markov chain choice model, the choice probability of product J is gonna be exactly the choice probability of product J under the multinomial logic model. Also these RGFSs happen to be coincidentally, these RGFSs, this is the visit probability for a product that we do not, that's the probability that a customer visits a product and does not purchase it. That also has the same form. And that also has the same form as the one that we have under the multinomial logic model. So that's one of the interesting things about the Markov chain choice model. Give me any multinomial logic model. If I choose the initial arrival probabilities like this and the transition probabilities like this, then the choice probabilities that's coming out of the Markov chain choice model is going to look exactly the same under the multinomial logic model. Again, remember, this is exactly sum over J and S, B, J. So this is precisely the choice probability under the multinomial logic model. So then let's verify this. Let's verify this. If I have a Markov chain choice model with these initial arrival probabilities and these transition probabilities, setting RG in this fashion, I'm sorry, PG in this fashion and RG in this fashion, indeed satisfies those flow balance equations for the Markov chain choice model. There you go. Let's do that. <clears throat> Here's the linear system of equations that we said we need to solve to compute the choice probabilities under the Markov chain choice model, right? So this is the system of equations that we saw that we need to solve uh, to compute the choice probabilities under the Markov chain choice model. Let me try to boil this system of equations to their essence. So we have one of these equations for every product. We have these one of these equations for every product. So here's what we're gonna do. Let me look at this equation. Let me look at this equation when I'm thinking of a product that is not offered. Let me look at this equation when I'm thinking of a product that is not offered. Well, if a product is not offered, PG of S is zero, so I can drop this guy. And when a product, so I can drop this guy and only left with RG of S, keep lambda G on the right-hand side. And we know that for every offered product, RG is zero. So I can do some for every product uh, that is offered, our i is going to be zero. So I can only take the sum over the products that are not offered. So this equation and this equation are identical to each other for the unoffered products, because for the unoffered products, PJSs are going to be zero. Let me again distill these equations to its essence for the offered products. For the offered products, what does this equation look like? If a product is offered, then RG is gonna be zero. So if a product is offered, this guy goes away. So we're only left with PJ on the left-hand side. Keep lambda J. And again, as we said, for the, for the offered products, RJs are always zero. So then when I look at the sum, it's of enough to take a sum only over the unoffered products. So this case for unoffered products and this case for the offered products is capturing what's written here with these boundary conditions. So these two guys are exactly equivalent to these two guys. I'm gonna work with the equations that are written in blue. So then what I would like to show is that if I calibrate my Markov chain choice model with lambda i's being like this, preference weight of product i divided by the total preference weight of everything, with row, IJ, with row ij's calibrated like this, preference weight of product j divided by the preference weight of everything, then setting pj's and rj's in this fashion satisfies those flow balance equations that I had on the next page. Let's verify them. Let me verify this equation. Let me start with the right-hand side. I choose lambda j to be the, I choose lambda j to be the preference weight of product j divided by the preference weight of everything. So I just replace lambda j by that. Take a sum over all i that is not in S. I choose rho i j to be preference weight of product j divided by the preference weight of everything. And I'm trying to verify that if I choose ris, as the choice probability under the multinomial logic model, I'm going to satisfy the system of equations. So then let me replace RIS as the choice probability under the multinomial logic model. We want to make sure that this is going to satisfy RJS, where RJS is the choice probability again under the multinomial logic model for product J. Let's check this out. So I end up with this. This is lambda J, sum over all I is not in S. This is rho IJ. This is RIFS, the solution that I'm checking. Let's do the arithmetic. I have Vj divided by the total preference weight here. Vj divided by total preference weight here. Factor that out. So you got a one left over here, one left over here, and you have this sum left over here. There is that sum left over here. Good. Keep this guy, keep that guy. 
If I take this sum, what am I going to have? If you equate the denominators, you're going to have one plus the preference weight of everything in S plus the preference weight of everything that is not in S. One plus the preference weight of everything in S, the preference weight of everything that is not in S. That is going to be one plus the preference weight of everything divided by the one plus the preference weight of everything in S. Cancel these two things. What do I have on the right hand side? That is the preference weight of product J divided by one plus the preference weight of all the products in uh, S. So that is again the solution that we postulated for our GFS. So indeed, this solution that we, sorry, where is it? This solution that we postulated satisfies our J of S equals lambda J plus I is not in S times rho I J times R I of S. It satisfies. And if you do the same arithmetic, the right hand side is the same. The arithmetic doesn't change. And in the end, you end up with the same value. And we postulate the same type of solution P G of S is. And that's also going to give us uh, V G of S divided by one plus V of S is also P G of S. Okay. From this algebra, we get to see that give me any multinomy logit model, I can calibrate my Markov chain choice model parameters in this way. And this Markov chain choice model is going to replicate the choice probabilities under the multinomy logit model. So our Markov chain choice model can exactly replicate the multinomy logit model and possibly do more. So this is a more flexible choice model than the multinomy logit model. Okay, this is another pause point for us. Great. Good, so now let's move on from the <clears throat> classical assortment optimization setting. So now let's try to move towards the more inventory problems. In particular, let's talk about revenue management over a network of resources. And I'm going to motivate the problem over here uh, with airline network revenue management problem, but there are other applications. But let me talk about airline revenue management problem just so that we have a specific application area to talk about. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to focus on the network of flight legs that are being operated on a particular departure date. So this is my departure date, and the airline is operating all these kinds of flights between these locations. We've got all these flights, and these flights have limited capacities. By using these flights, the airline is offering different kinds of itineraries to its customers. Like for example, the airline might be offering this itinerary that goes from this location to this location through these three flight legs. Or the airline could be offering this itinerary that goes from that location, again, this location through these two flight legs. Or the airline could be offering this itinerary. So by using these available flight legs, the airline is offering a whole bunch of, flight, a whole bunch of itineraries that go from different locations to different destinations, from different origins to different destinations. So over time, the airline is going to decide which of these itineraries to make available to its customers. The customers are going to come in and they're going to look at what itinerary is available for purchase. And they're going to make a choice within these itineraries according to, the, according to some kind of choice model. And we're going to use the Markov chain choice model to capture the choice behavior of the customers. And what we want to do is we want to find a policy for the airline to figure out which assortment of itineraries to offer to its customers so that it maximizes the total expected revenue over a selling horizon. And of course, as we sell the itineraries, those sales are going to consume capacities on different flight legs. So we want to make sure that as we make our itinerary offering decisions, we do not violate the capacities on the flight legs. That's going to be important consideration. Being on okay. So what we're going to do today here is we're going to give it a give a we're going to give this problem a simple deterministic linear programming formulation. This is going to be very similar to the fluid approximations that Rene looked at in the first module. Uh, for the problem, for our problem, that linear problem is going to have a very large number of decision variables. But the beautiful result we're going to be able to prove is that if the choice of our customers is governed by the multi domain logic model, we're going to be able to take that linear program that has got a lot of decision variables, an exponential number of decision variables. We're going to condense that linear program to an equivalent linear program with a very small, with a polynomial number of decision variables. So we're going to give a very nice tractable reduced form of that linear program, that fluid approximation. Okay. So that's what we're going to show today. So let's try to write down that linear programming approximation that I'm talking about, this fluid approximation. So here's some notation. Let's say L is the set of flight legs that we're operating on a departure date. N is the set of itineraries that the customer, uh, N is the set of itineraries that the airline could offer to its customers. Uh, the problem is going to take place over a finite selling horizon. So this is my departure date that I'm looking at. This is when bookings for that departure date start. So I'm going to take that selling horizon and chop it into little time periods. And these time periods are going to be small enough that 
there is going to be one cost in reliability each time. So it's a pretty uh, standard modeling trick for revenue management problems. So we're going to take our selling horizon, chop it in a little time periods, and there's going to be one cost in arrival in each time period. Uh, CI is going to be the capacity available, initial capacity available on flight deck I. AIG is going to take value one. If I turn J uses flight deck I, otherwise AIJ takes value zero. So these AIJs are telling me which itineraries are using which flight legs, which flight legs are included in which itineraries. RG is going to be the fare for itinerary J. So this is the revenue for itinerary J. So this is how much money we make if we sell one ticket for itinerary J. And lastly, this PG of us is going to be the choice probability for itinerary J, given that the airline is offering the assortment S of itineraries. So given that the airline is offering the assortment S of itineraries, PG of us is the probability that a customer chooses itinerary J. And we're going to assume that these PG offices are governed by the multi-enemy logic model. Okay, good. <coughs> so now let's write a uh, deterministic linear programming approximation for this problem. In this approximation, our decision variable is going to be H or H of S. Our decision variable is going to be H of S. And H of S is going to be the number of time periods in the selling horizon, number of time periods in the selling horizon, during which you offer the subset S of itineraries. So that's my decision variable. For how many time periods do I offer a certain set of certain subset of itineraries to my customers? So that's my decision variable. So let's write down our linear program. Let me start with the objective function. During a time period that we offer the subset S of itineraries, this is the probability that a customer is going to purchase itinerary J. If a customer purchases itinerary J, this is the revenue that we make at overall itineraries. So this is the expected revenue that we obtain during a time period that we offer the subset S of itineraries. This is the number of time periods that we offer the subset S of itineraries. Multiply over all subsets. This is the total expected revenue over the whole selling horizon. And that is what I'm trying to maximize in my objective function. The constraint that we have here is a capacity constraint. Again, during a time period that we offer the subset S of itineraries, this is the probability that the customer purchases itinerary J. If itinerary J uses uh, flight leg I, if AIG equals one, then those sales are going to consume the capacity on the right flight leg. So this product, this product is the capacity consumption on flight leg I due to my sales for itinerary J during a time period that we offer the subset S of itineraries. That overall itineraries, this is gonna be the capacity consumption on flight leg I during a time period that we offer the subset S of itineraries. This is the number of time periods that we offer the subset S of itineraries. And overall subset S of itineraries, this is going to be the total expected capacity consumption on flight like I that should not ex exceed the capacity available on flight like I. So I'm imposing a capacity limit, imposing the capacity limit on flight like I, but I'm just saying that the expected sales, expected capacity consumption on flight like I is not going to exceed the capacity on flight like I. So I'm imposing the capacity constraints only in the expected sense. And this last constraint says the number of time periods, the total number of time periods during which I offer a subset has to be exactly the number of time periods in the selling horizon. So at each time period, I need to offer a subset, but that subset could be an empty subset. But at each time period, I have to offer a subset. So this is a crude deterministic linear programming approximation, a fluid approximation for our problem that takes place actually under uncertainty, but let's just work with this crude deterministic linear programming approximation. The decision variables are H of S, H of S, H of S, linear in H of S. This is all data, linear in H of S, linear of H of S, this is a linear program. But this is a linear program where we have a huge number of decision variables for every subset of itineraries that I can offer to my customers. I have one decision variable in this linear program. So this is a pretty humongous linear program. So here's the main result that we're gonna show regarding this linear program. This linear program that we formulated that has a huge number of decision variables, it turns out that we can reduce this linear program the, whose number of decision variables is only two times n, where n is the number of itineraries. The number of decision variables over here is two to the n. For each subset of itineraries, we have a decision variable. The number of decision variables that we have is two to the n. We're gonna reduce this linear program to an equivalent linear program that has only two n decision variables. And let me try to run you through this linear program, give a feel for what this linear program looks like, how this linear program works. And then after that, we're gonna show that these two linear programs are indeed exactly equivalent to each other. So we're gonna actually show why these two linear programs are exactly equivalent to each other. But let me try to give you a feel for what this linear program does, roughly, intuitively. In this linear program, interpret XJ as 
the expected number of sales for itinerary J. That's the interpretation of this decision variable. Well, this is the expected number of sales for itinerary J. From each one of them, I make a revenue for J, either all itineraries. That is what I'm trying to maximize in the objective function. This is the expected number of sales for itinerary J. If itinerary J uses flight leg I, if AIG equals one, those sales are going to consume the capacity on the I flight leg. So this product is the capacity consumption on the I flight leg due to my decisions for itinerary J. And overall itineraries, this is the total expected capacity consumption on the I flight leg that should not exceed the capacity on the I flight leg. Okay, good. So now I have these decision variables XJ, and I also have these decision variables YJ. Interpret XJ as the total expected number of customers who, during their choice process, visit the itinerary J in their Marco chain choice model. They visit the itinerary J and they ended up purchasing the itinerary J and interpret YJ as the total expected number of customers who, during their choice process in the Marco chain choice model, visited the itinerary J but did not purchase the itinerary J because the itinerary J were not made available to them. So this last constraint that we're seeing here looks very much like the flow balance equations that we needed to solve for computing the choice probabilities under the Markov chain choice model, okay? So then this says maximize the expected revenue from the sales, make sure that the total expected capacity consumption on the right flight leg does not violate the capacity on the right flight leg. And intuitively speaking, these constraints make sure that, make sh these constraints make sure that the sales that we're seeing are indeed governed by the Markov chain choice model. Okay, and now we're going to see why this linear program that has got only two undecision variables and roughly, you know, number of flight legs plus number of itineraries type of number of constraints is 100% identical to this uh, really big uh, wide linear program. We're going to see the columns between the two. Okay, um, again, a pause point. Good. So let's see the equivalence between these two linear programs. I want to show that this linear program is equivalent to this linear program. So I'm going to start with the top linear program in blue, and I'm going to end up with the yellow linear program that is at the bottom. And as we do this, what we're going to use is the fact that we could solve the assortment optimization under the Markov chain choice model as a linear program. That is going to come very handy. OK, um, let's do can that. Can I ask a, a question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so then you are able to solve the, the, the yellow linear program, but then you still need a way to translate your decision variable of that uh, LP to a number of time yes. periods you want to offer a certain subset or something, right? Yes, and there's Sorry. a way to do that too. Yes, there's okay. a way to do that too. Um, and I'm not gonna, so, so let's get to that. There's a way to do that too, let's get to that. I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but I'm gonna touch up on that. That's a okay, but perfect it valid point. All right. That's, yeah. that, is, that is a valid, there is a, there is a way to do that. That's a perfect valid point. You don't only really wanna get the objective functions, but you wanna be able to get the solution to this problem, convert it into decision variables to the previous problem H of S's, and there is a way to do that. That's a very good point. Good. Any other comments? Good. So then let's start with the blue problem and see how the blue problem reduces to the uh, yellow problem at the bottom. Here is the blue problem that's at the top. Instead of solving the blue problem that is at the top, let's solve the dual of this blue problem. So let's associate the dual variable mu i with these capacity constraints. And let's associate the dual variable sigma with that last constraint. And let's try to deal off that blue problem. What do you got? What do we got? Ci times mu i added over all i, t times sigma in the objective function, and I'm minimizing the objective function in the dual. There is one decision variable, there is one type of decision variable in the primal h of s. So let's write the constraint in the dual problem that corresponds to the primal decision variable h of s. What do we got? Uh, the coefficient of h of s in this constraint is this much. So then that much multiplied by mu i added over all i. The coefficient of hs in this constraint is one, so plus another sigma. The coefficient of hs in the objective function is this much, that is greater than equal to the coefficient of hs in the objective function. And then I have this constraint for every s because I have one decision of h of s for every s. So this is the dual of the big linear program that I would like to solve. So these two problems are 100% equivalent to each other. One is the dual of the other one. So, so far, so good. What I'm gonna do next is, I'm going to shuffle this constraint a little bit. Let me take this left-hand side 
throw it to the right hand side. So I'm not going to do anything except that take this take this term on the left hand side, take this term on the left hand side, throw it to the right hand side. There is that. So I just show to that constraint. So now one useful observation is the following. In the objective function, I'm trying to make this objective function as small as possible. I'm minimizing. So I'm going to try to make sigma as small as possible. If I make sigma as small as possible, if you push sigma as small as possible, it is going to bump into the largest one of these terms over every subset. So when I push sigma as small as possible, when I'm optimizing this problem, sigma is going to be exactly equal to the maximum of these guys over every subset. So in an optimal solution, sigma is going to be exactly equal to max of these guys over every subset. So I can replace sigma by the max of these guys over every subset and forget about this constraint. Let me do that. I replace sigma by the max of these guys over every subset and then forget that constraint. So this guy is precisely the dual of the big linear program that I would like to solve. So far, so good. OK. So I wrote down the dual of the original linear program that I would like to solve as a min max problem. In the outer min problem, I'm minimizing over mu. In the inner problem for fixed mu, I'm minimizing over, I'm maximizing over the assortments. I'm maximizing over the assortments for fixed mu in the inner problem. Good. So the optimal objective value of this problem, the optimal objective value of this max problem is going to depend on the choice of mu. So let me denote this max as, let me denote the optimal objective value of this maximization problem as, let me denote the optimal objective value of this maximization problem as g of mu. There is it. So if I denote the optimal objective value of this maximization problem as g of mu, then this becomes my dual. And here's the definition of g of mu. So then this is still the dual of the original problem that I would like to solve, except that I hid a lot of the dirty business into this g of mu. So let me work this g of mu function a little bit. What is this? What is this g of mu function? If you realize this is precisely the assortment optimization problem, this is precisely the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model. I'm finding an assortment S to offer. If I offer the assortment S, this is the problem that the customer purchases product J. And if the customer purchases product J, I'm making a revenue of this much. So for fixed mu, this is precisely the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model, where the revenue associated with product J is this much. And I know how to solve the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model by solving a linear program. There is that linear program. Get these VJs, which was the optimal expected revenue from a customer who arrives in my Markov chain uh, with an intention to purchase product J. Put the constraint that says VJ is greater than or equal to the revenue of product J. In this problem, the revenue of product J is this much. Put another constraint that says VJ is greater than or equal to the optimal expected revenue from a customer when the customer transitions out of product J according to the transition probabilities. So VJ is greater than or equal to this much. And then in my objective function, minimize the optimal expected revenues over all customer types. So remember, this was the minimization LP that we solved to find the optimal assortment to, compute, to solve the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model. So then this shows that I can compute this G of mu business for a fixed mu by solving this minimization problem. I can compute this G of mu by solving this minimization problem where the decision variables are just VJs. So let me replace this G of mu by this minimization problem. There you go. I'm minimizing over mu's at the other problem. And for fixed mu's to compute the G of mu's, I need to solve this minimization problem. That is the LP that computes my G of mu's here. This is the LP that computes my G of mu's here. So now the dual of the problem that I would like to solve, the dual of my big linear program, has been formulated as a mean mean problem. In the outside mean, I'm minimizing over mu's. In the inside mean for fixed mu's, I'm minimizing over VJs. But since it's a mean mean problem, Instead of first minimizing over v's and then minimizing over mu's, I can minimize over mu and v's all at the same time because it's a min min problem. Let's minimize over mu and v's at the same time. So then this is the dual of the original linear program that I would like to solve. And if you take the dual of this problem, if you take the dual of this problem, you, what did I do here? If you take the dual of this problem, if you take the dual of this problem, this is precisely the problem that we end up. And this is the uh, simple linear program that I was showing you at the, at the beginning of this part of the talk, okay? So that is what it boils down. It's a simple duality argument and using the fact that we can use the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model by solving a simple linear program. So then we inject that linear program into our uh, big dual, if you like. Okay, 
This problem is known as the sales-based linear program. And the reason people call this as a sales-based linear program is that my decision variables is now not what assortments I offer to my customers. My decision variables are now the expected sales that I make for each itinerary, but I need to include these additional constraints that ensures that the sales that I make for each one of these itemies are going to be consistent with the Markov chain choice model. But again, this linear program shows that I don't, under the Markov chain choice model, I do not need to solve this humongous LP. I can just solve this reduced LP form, and it's these two linear programs is going to have the same optimal objective values. And one of the comments was, Laura's comment was, I'm not really satisfied by just showing that these two problems have the matching optimal objective values. I want to be able to show the fact that if I get the optimal solution to this problem, I can recover an optimal solution to the big linear program that we have at the beginning. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but that is also possible to do. If you give me an optimal solution, X star, Y star, to the reduced deterministic linear program, to the smaller deterministic linear program, I can recover an optimal solution, H star, these H star S's, to the original deterministic linear program in time and cube time. And N is the number of items. So there's a polynomial time algorithm that takes the solution to the smaller linear program and produces an optimal solution to the original linear program. Okay, so you can like seamlessly go between the optimal solutions as well, but I'm not going to go into the details of this result and I'm going to provide a preference at the very end. Good. So this is one cute result that we can get when we're dealing with this huge deterministic linear program that shows up as a fluid approximation to our uh, network revenue management problem, network problem. Um, let's take another pause. Any comments? Good. So the next thing we're going to do is <clears throat> we're going to look at another revenue management problem that takes place over time. But in this revenue management problem, our assortment decisions are going to be constrained by the availability of a single resource. In the previous case, we have a bunch of flight legs, so our assortment decisions was constrained by the availabilities of multiple flight legs. Now we're going to think about a revenue management problem where the assortment decisions is constrained by a single resource. We're going to write a dynamic program for this revenue management problem, and we're going to see a very nice, very nice characterization of the optimal policy when, again, customers are choosing under the Markov chain choice model. Okay, so here's the problem that we're going to look at. Again, I'm going to couch the problem in the airline revenue management setting. Uh, so let's look at a single flight leg that is being operated between a particular origin and a particular destination. So let's look at a flight leg, let's say, that is being operated between New York City and San Francisco, right? New York City and San Francisco, the single flight leg between a certain origin and a certain destination. And on this flight leg, I could be offering um, I could be offering different types of fare classes, an expensive, full refundable fare class, a little bit less expensive, full refundable fare class, but as long as you exchange your ticket 15 days before departure, an even less expensive, partially refundable fare class, and a cheap and non-refundable fare class. So I'm offering a whole bunch of different fare classes on my uh, flight, on this particular flight. There is limited capacity on the flight. Uh, the customers are going to come in over time, and to each arriving customer, I'm going to decide which set of fare classes to make available. The customer is going to look at what fare classes are available and she's going to make a choice within these fare classes. And the choice of the customer is going to be governed by the Markov chain choice model. And again, our goal is to dynamically figure out which set of fare classes to make available to our customer so that we maximize the total expected uh, revenue over the, until the departure time of this flight. Rate. So this is the problem that we would like to look at. So what we're gonna do is, now we're going to look at the optimal policy for this problem. We're gonna write a dynamic program to compute the optimal policy for this problem. And we're going to see a very nice structure of the optimal policy when the choices of the customers are governed by the multinomial logic model. Good. <coughs> so the problem still takes place over a finite selling horizon. This is the departure time of my New York to San Francisco flight. And this is when the bookings for that flight leg start. Six months in advance of that uh, departure date, I'm starting to sell tickets. We're again going to take that selling horizon and chop it into little time periods. And these time periods are going to be small enough that there is going to be one customer arrival in each time period. Good. So then in terms of our notation, um, RG is going to be the fare for fare class J. So this is how much money we make if we sell one ticket for fare class J. And PGFSS is going to be the choice probabilities for each assortment. 
So given that we offer the subset S of pair classes, given that we offer the subset S of pair classes, PJS is the probability that a customer chooses pair class J. And again, these choice probabilities are going to be governed by the multi, this is going to be governed by the Markov chain choice model. So then here's the dynamic programming formulation for our problem. I'm sitting at time PDT. The remaining capacity in my flight leg is X. So I'm using state variable X to keep track of the remaining capacity of my flight leg. I'm sitting at time PDT. The remaining capacity of my flight legs is given by X and I'm trying to compute the optimal expected revenue to come. If I offer the assortment S of pair classes, this is the probability that a customer is going to choose fair class J. If the customer chooses fair class J, I get the fair for that fair class RJ. And I walk into the next time period with one less unit of capacity. This is the probability that the customer does not purchase anything. In that case, I walk into the next time period with the same capacity that I had before. Okay. All right. I am trying to find an assortment to choose that maximizes the immediate expected revenue plus the expected value function the next time period. So that's my Bellman equation. Let's clean this up a little bit. In particular, I have over here sum over j, pj times v of x minus one. Like I was here, like I have here, minus sum over j, pj of s, v of x. If I put those two things together, what do I get? Sum over j, pj s, v of x minus one. Sum over j, pj of s, v of x with a negative sign in front. If I put those two things together, and if I do that, I have a one times V of X, keep that one times V of X on the way outside. Okay, so I just shuffle the terms in my dynamic programming formulation. And just to make my notation a little bit simpler, this term that we're seeing here, this thing, how much the value function at the next time period changes when I lose one unit of capacity, I'm gonna denote that by delta VT, delta VT plus one of X. So that is the change in the value function if I go from X units of capacity to X minus one units of capacity, that is essentially the opportunity cost of having one, unit, one more unit of capacity at the next time period when I had, that's the opportunity cost of, let me say, losing one unit of capacity when I had X units of capacity at the next time period. So this is the dynamic programming formulation we're going to work with, okay? And if I'm sitting at time period T, if I'm sitting at time period T and the remaining capacity on my flight is X, then this is the optimization problem that I need to solve to find the optimal assortment fair or fair classes to offer. Let me say it again. According to this dynamic program, if I'm sitting at time period T and the remaining capacity on my flight leg is X, then this is the optimization problem that I need to solve to find the optimal assortment, optimal assortment of fair classes to offer. So this maximization problem is going to drive the optimal assortment that I need to offer at time period T, given that remaining capacity on my flight leg is X. Let's stop here for a second and let's see if everybody's on board with the dynamic programming formulation for this single flight leg revenue management problem. And we're gonna to try to characterize the structure of the optimal policy for this uh, single flight leg problem. Good. So then here's a list of structural results for this uh, single flight leg uh, dynamic assortment optimization, dynamic network revenue management problem, if you like. The first thing that we can prove is the following. The first difference is these deltas. We can prove that the first difference of the value function decreases in the capacity. Namely, this one says, the opportunity cost, the value of having one more unit of capacity is smaller as I have more amount of capacity I have in, more, in, in, in hand, okay? So this one basically says, if I have more and more units of capacity on hand, the value of having one more unit of capacity is going to be smaller. So there is marginal decreasing value from having additional units of capacity. So that's one structural result that you can prove by working with that dynamic problem. If I have 10 units of capacity, if you, if you give me one more unit of capacity on top of that, versus if I have 100 units of capacity, and if you give me one more unit of capacity on top of that, when I have 10 and you give me more, the value that I can gra grab from that initial, that extra capacity is gonna be more. If I have fewer units of capacity, the extra value from an additional unit of capacity is gonna be larger. So that is the first structural result that we can prove. So that one says the value of an additional unit of capacity becomes smaller as I have more capacity available on hand. The second, uh, the second in the structural result says the following. The first difference of the value function gets smaller as I get closer to the departure time. So this one says, if I have X units of capacity, and if you give me one more unit of capacity, 
the value that I can extract from that addition of capacity is going to get smaller when you give me that capacity later in the selling horizon, which again makes sense. If I have X units of capacity on hand, and if you give me one more capacity, if you give me that capacity earlier on, then I can do more with that capacity. The value of that capacity is going to be larger. If you give me that capacity later in the selling horizon, the extra value from the additional capacity is going to get smaller. So the value of an addition of capacity gets smaller if you give me that capacity later in the selling horizon. So this one again says the value of an addition of capacity decreases as there is less time left until the departure time of the flight. Because if you give me the capacity later on, I can do less with that capacity. These two results are very classic results for these kinds of single resource revenue management problems. And actually Rene, um, in his module, showed similar results when there was no choice behavior, but we can prove analogs of these results when there is choice. And I'm not going to the details, I'm not gonna go into the proofs of these results, but I can give you references of these results at the end. So we're not gonna prove these two results. But by leveraging these two results, we're gonna show two very interesting properties, two very interesting properties. This property says the following. As we have more capacity available at a time period, then the optimal assortment offer becomes a larger assortment. Let's see if I have 10 units of capacity that I have available at a time period, I'm going to offer this assortment of pair classes. Versus if I have 20 units of capacity available at a time period, I'm going to offer a larger assortment. So if I have more capacity available at a certain time period, the optimal assortment offer is gonna get larger. What does it say? Well, if you're stuck with larger and larger amount of capacity at a certain time period, what are you gonna say? Oh dear, I have way too much capacity on hand. I gotta liquidate all this capacity. And the way to liquidate this capacity is to offer a larger assortment. So that's one structural result that comes out of the optimal policy for this dynamic assortment optimization problem for the single lake revenue management problem. <coughs> Another structure result that we can prove is this last one. And that one says, if I have a certain amount of capacity on hand and I'm getting closer to the departure time with that certain amount of capacity, the optimal assortment also gets larger. So what I mean by that is, let's say I have five units of capacity on hand and I'm getting closer and closer to the departure time with that five units of capacity on hand. So the departure time is getting nearer and nearer. Again, I'm gonna say, oh dear, I got this five units of capacity on hand. I'm closing and getting closer and closer to the departure time. I got to liquidate, and the way to liquidate is again to offer larger and larger assortments. If I'm getting closer to the departure time with the same amount of capacity I have on hand, the optimal assortment offer is going to be a larger and larger assortment. As you get closer to time, departure time, I'm going to have little and little more and less and less time to liquidate inventory. So to liquidate faster, I'm going to offer larger assortments. So in our remaining time, we're going to see where these kinds, where these two structural results are coming from. And these, these two structural results are going to strictly exploit the fact that the customers are choosing under the Markov chain choice model. Okay, good. Any comments at a high level from these structural results before we dive into these two properties? Okay. And let me roll back before I say, before we go into the proofs of those two last structural results. These two properties, the value of a capacity decreases as we have more capacity on hand. The value of a capacity decreases as we get closer to the departure time. The value of a capacity decreases as we have more capacity on hand. The marginal value of a capacity decreases as we get closer to the departure time. These two results holds under a great generality of choice model. So these two results do not require the Markov chain choice model, okay? These two results do use the specific, particle, specific structure of the Markov chain choice model. These two hold under great general, generality. They do not necessarily require the Markov chain choice model, but these two are going to require the Markov chain choice model. So now let's show this result. Let's show this one, which, which, is, a, which is saying, as we have more and more capacity left at a certain time period, the optimal assortment to offer is going to be a larger assortment. Let's show that result. Here's what we want to show. Let's say I'm sitting at time period T, and the remaining capacity on my flight leg is X. According to my dynamic program, this is the sort of, oh, this is the problem that I need to solve to find the optimal assortment to offer. That's coming from my dynamic program. And let's also say I'm sitting at time period T and the remaining capacity on my flight leg is X plus one. Then this is the problem that I need to solve with the remaining capacity X plus one. Then this is the problem that I need to solve to get the optimal assortment to offer at time period T. So according to my dynamic program, this is the optimal assortment offer at time period T when I have X units of capacity. 
This is the optimal sorbent to solve, uh, optimal sorbent to offer when I have x plus one in soft capacity. What we want to show is that if I'm sitting at time period t with more and more capacity, I'm going to say, well, I have more and more capacity on hand. I got to liquidate. I got to offer a larger sorbent. So what we want to show is that if I'm sitting at time period t with more capacity left on hand, the optimal sorbent is going to be larger when compared with the case when I had less inventory on hand. So I want to show that this assortment is a larger assortment when compared with the case I had X units of inventory. Again, these are all soft. These are all soft. Okay, good. So I want to show that this assortment is a larger assortment than this. That's what we're trying to do. And here's how we're going to do that. Let's look at the optimization problem that I need to solve in order to compute the optimal assortment, given that I have X plus one units of inventory. This is the problem that I would like to solve. Equality, I'm going to write this problem as add and subtract delta VT plus one of X. So they, these two things are added and subtracted. So these two problems are perfectly equivalent to each other. So I just added and subtracted delta VT plus one of X. Okay, so these two problems are equivalent to each other. But now, if you look at this term, if you look at this term, what is this? This is the marginal value of an addition width of capacity when I have X units of inventory. This is the marginal value of addition width of capacity when I have X plus one units of capacity. We've seen in the structural properties, as we have more units of inventory on hand, the value of an addition width of inventory goes down. So this number is less than this number. So this number, this again, this number is less than this number. Because again, in our first structural result, we said the value of an addition width of capacity gets smaller when I have more capacity on hand. So this difference is a positive number. This difference is a positive number. And let me denote that difference as delta. The big delta, let me put it over here. So then, if you compare this problem that computes the optimal assortment when I have x plus one units of inventory with this problem when I have that computes the optimal assortment when I have x units of inventory, well, in this problem, the revenues of the products are rj minus delta vt plus one of x. In this problem, <laughs> in this problem, the revenues of the products are rj again, delta vt plus one of x plus a positive term added on the top of each one of the revenues. And in the very first portion of the talk, we saw that if you increase the revenue of each product by a constant factor delta, the optimal assortment gets larger. So in this problem, the revenues of the products has been increased from this amount with an amount delta. So as a result, the optimal problem in this assortment optimization problem is going to be larger than the optimal assortment in this assortment optimization problem. So this assortment is going to be a larger assortment than this assortment. That's how we get that. It's only coming because of the fact that this term is a positive increment on the revenues of each product when I compare these two assortment optimization problems. Okay, good. Any questions, any comments about this structural result? Good. So then what we obtain is that uh, in, our struct, in, our, in our optimal policy, as we have more and more capacity on hand, the optimal assortment offer becomes a larger and larger assortment. And there's a very nice implication of that result. So let me again, the last thing we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you today, the policy implication of this structural result. Um, so let's say uh, I'm sitting at a certain time period and I have, let's say five fair classes that I can offer to my customers. Let me think about the optimal, opt opt optimal assortment of fair classes to offer to my customers as a function of the remaining capacity on hand. So I'm sitting at a certain time period I have five fair classes to offer to my customers, and I'm looking at the optimal assortment of fair classes to offer to my customers as a function of the remaining capacity. Let's say when I have largest amount of remaining capacity, the optimal thing to do is to offer the largest, 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 largest assortment. And what we've shown is that if I have smaller and smaller amounts of capacity, the optimal assortment is going to be a smaller and smaller assortment. So let's say the picture looks like this. If I have full capacity, I offer everything. If I have one less unit of capacity, I still offer everything. One less unit of capacity, I still offer everything. Let's see if I have this amount of capacity, I stop offering product five. And again, from our structure result, we know that if I have fewer and fewer amounts of capacity, the optimal assortment offer is gonna get smaller and smaller in the weak sense. So let's see if the capacity gets smaller and smaller, I still offer these four fair classes. If the capacity goes below down this, then I stop offering fair class four. And if uh, the capacity gets below this number, I stop offering fair class three and so on and so forth. 
So we now shown that the optimal assortments of fair classes to offer at different fair capacity levels has this picture. As I have smaller and smaller amount of capacity left on hand, the optimal assortment is going to get a, is going to shrink. That's the structure that we proved already. Okay. So then, if I want to implement the optimal policy, here's how I can think of the optimal policy. The optimal policy says the following. Well, there is a protection level for fair class five, such that if the remaining capacity on my flight leg is smaller than this quantity, it's optimal not to offer fair class five. If the remaining capacity on my flight leg is greater than this quantity, it's optimal to offer fair class five. So there is a cutoff value for the capacity on my flight leg, such that if the, if the capacity is left is less than that cutoff value, it's optimal to not to offer fair class five. Otherwise, it's optimal to offer fair class five. I call it as the protection level for fair class five. Likewise, there's a protection level for fair class four that says, if the remaining capacity on your flight leg is greater than the protection level for fair class four, then it's optimal to offer fair class four. If the remaining capacity on your fair flight leg is less than the protection level for fair class four, it's optimal not to offer fair class four. So then because of this picture, we have this cute policy structure that says the following. For every fair class, I can associate a protection level such that by comparing the remaining capacity on my flight leg with the protection level for fair class J, I can immediately decide whether I should be offering fair class J or not. Let me say it again. For every fair class J, I can associate a protection level such that by comparing the remaining capacity on my flight leg with the protection level for fair class J, I can decide whether protection, whether fair class J should be offered or not. This is a very different way of implementing the optimal policy. In our original dynamic program, our decisions were which assortment of fair classes to offer to our customers. We were thinking about which assortments to offer. We were thinking about all of these fair classes as an assortment, as a bundle. But now we're saying that we can implement the optimal policy by comparing the remaining capacity on my flight leg with the protection level for fair class J. And if the remaining capacity is less than the protection level for fair class J, do not offer fair class J. So I can make the decisions to offer each fair class one by one by comparing the remaining capacity on fair class J with the protection level for fair class J. So I can make an offer not offer decision for eight fair class J individually by comparing the capacity with the fair class with the protection level for that fair class. So this is now a very sort of like an intuitive or a much simpler way of implementing the optimal policy rather than thinking of bundles, assortments of fair classes. And again, this structure is coming because of the fact that our problem is driven by the, our choices are driven by the uh, Markov chain choice model. Um, so <clears throat> this Markov chain choice model is a big choice model. It's got a, it's a choice model that has n squared parameters, right? We have a transition matrix and for each entry, we've got a different parameter. It's got n squared parameters in it, roughly speaking. So it's got a lot of parameters. And because of that, this Markov chain choice model has a lot of flexibility to capture the choice process of the customers. But when we work with real data, if we have very small amount of training data to fit your Markov chain choice model, it can overfit to the training data. As a result, it's out of sample performance can be actually bad. So that's one thing that we need to, you need to be careful when working with the Markov chain choice model. We can actually verify that behavior on the working, with, uh, working with some uh, data. So here I'm gonna show you how the prediction behavior of the multi-anomal logic model and the Markov chain choice model changes when you have different levels of training data. So what we did here was, I'm not gonna go into the details of this experiment all that much. What we did was we had a bunch of uh, purchasing data and we had a bunch of data set with 500 customers making purchases, 1,000 customers making purchases, 2,500 and 5,000 customers making purchases. So I have more and more data availability to fit my choice models. And I fit a Markov chain choice model and a multinomial choice model, multinomial logic choice model to these uh, purchase data. And on the y-axis, although I forgot to label the y-axis, we're looking at the out of sample likelihood that I get when I fit different uh, these two choice models to my uh, purchasing data, okay? And larger likelihood implies that the choice model is doing a better job of capturing the choices of the customers. So an interesting picture that we get, and this is a pretty consistent picture. The purple is the out of sample likelihoods of the Markov chain choice model. The orange is the out of sample likelihoods of the multinomial logic model. The picture is that if you have too little data, 
The out of sample likelihood of the model trinomial logic model is better. So if you have too little data, the Markov chain choice model overfits, its out of sample likelihood is poor. But as you get more and more data, the overfitting goes away because overfitting does not become a concern anymore. So the modeling flexibility of the Markov chain choice model pays off. So then we get better likelihoods. And this is a pretty consistent picture that I observed when I was playing with this Markov chain choice model uh, in practice and fitting data and whatnot. So let's wrap up. Um, again, one interest. So what are the other useful things that we can think about? Um, we didn't talk about estimating parameters of this Markov chain choice model. That is one interesting problem that several people have looked at. Another interesting thing we can think about is in the multinomial logit model, many times people express the preference weights of the products as a features of the products. Like as a, you know, if you're thinking about computers, you can estimate the, you can estimate the preference weight of a computer as its price, RAM, CPU speed, weight, and whatever. One of the undesirable aspects of the Markov chain choice model is it's not clear how to parameterize the uh, transition probabilities and the initial probability arrival probabilities as a function of the features of the products. So that is one undesirable of the aspect of the Markov chain choice model. It's hard to parameterize as a function of the features of the products. There is more work needs to be done. This is going to be the last lecture we're going to do on assortment optimization. So we talked about multinomial logit, nested logit. Uh, and the Markov chain choice model. There are many other choice models that we did not touch. And one important choice model, class of choice models, are these choice models that are called the preference list based choice models. And I'm going to give references on that uh, at the very end in the next lecture, in the next slide, I'm sorry. But that is one big class of choice models that we did not touch upon at all. And lastly, when we looked at the assortment optimization problem under the Markov chain choice model, we did not consider any constraints on the offered assortment. There is work on incorporating constraints in assortment optimization problems. When we put constraints on assortment optimization under the Markov chain choice model, the problem becomes a whole lot more difficult. The solution strategies becomes a whole lot more involved. And I'm going to give you a reference for that as well. But again, that complicates the problem quite a bit under the Markov chain choice model. So let me wrap up with some references. Again, this is a super incomplete list of references, but um, I tried to fit everything in one page. This is the paper that started it off. This is the first paper on the Markov chain choice model. And then after that, uh, I did, I worked, I played around with this Markov chain choice model a little bit as well. And this is the paper that does constraint assortment optimization under the Markov chain choice model. Okay. And I was thinking about these preference list-based choice models. These are three very nice references on the preference list based choice models. Um, there is some work on estimating the parameters of the Markov chain choice model. This is something on estimating the parameters of the Markov chain choice model. Um, there's actually a very nice sort of like a survey like paper that looks at a bunch of choice models and look at the uh, prediction ability of these different choice models. That is that paper. Um, this Deterministic fluid approximation, this big linear program that we talked about, goes back to these two papers. These are the first papers that studied that big deterministic linear programming formulation. And this is the paper, this is the first paper that studied that single leg revenue management paper for which we characterize the structure of the optimal policy. And lastly, um, our reduced linear program, our reduced linear program for this Markov chain choice model, you know, from Thinking about assortments of uh, itineraries, we thought about the sales for the itineraries. That result was proven for the multinomial logit model in this paper. So that's kind of like the first sales-based linear program that was proven for the multinomial logit model. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and also I should, again, as I said, this is a super incomplete set of references. There are many, many different choice models that are, ex that are left over here that are not sort of, uh, that did not be go over. And although I did not put in my slides, I should emphasize that Aydin is in the audience. There's actually another very cute choice model that is utility to this that Aydin worked on, which is called the exponomial choice model that is based on uh, characterizing the utility of the of utilities of the products by negative of the by exponent, ex, exponential random variables. That is also a very nice reference. Uh, get in touch with Aydin. I've taken all these in the audience here for that choice model, there's actually a lot of interesting things that you can do under exponential distributed utilities as well. Again, with my apologies for not including in my for not including that in my references. Okay, so this is I think what I would like to stop. Let's take a few more points for questions. Uh, as Victor said at the beginning of our lecture, 
Our next last lecture is going to be on next Monday, same time. And then we're going to talk about dynamic assortment optimization problems in the next lecture. We've been talking mostly about static one-shot assortment optimization problems. In the next lecture, we're going to prove, we're going to come up with provably near optimal policies for dynamic assortment optimization problems. All right. Questions, comments before, before we stop today's lecture. So in the single leg uh, problem, um, can you say something about the optimal, the, how the optimal policy looks, uh, for example, when T is very large, would you always start with one product, which is the most profitable one and then slowly increase your assortment or that's a that's a very good point and that's if t is large enough i would bet my next salary that that is going to be the structure of the optimal policy if t is super large then right what are you going to do let me take my chances at the super largest revenue product i want to see if i can push that product to a customer and then gradually increase your assortment and of course if T is very large and I'm starting with some, you know, if T is not, let's not say very large, large, large enough. We offer the single product with the largest revenue, right? And we don't make a sale, we don't make a sale, we don't make a sale. Gradually, then you're going to offer the assortment or enlarge the assortment. Then you're going to make a sale. As you make a sale, then maybe then you're going to shrink your assortment a little bit, right? Because the capacity got smaller, then you may, you may say, oh, okay, you know, I had three units of capacity before, now I have two. Then let me again take a chance with a smaller assortment because I got only two left now. So whenever a sale occurs, you may shrink your assortment a little bit. Right? Mm -hmm. Good. Interesting. Yeah. Exactly. But that's precisely the question. Pre I mean, precisely the structure. Mm -hmm. uh, can you also um, go back to uh, uh, the slide where you compared the uh, estimation error for the uh, Markov chain versus multinomial logic. So, so can you explain? So, given that the Markov chain is a strict generalization of the uh, multinomial logic uh, model, uh, what explains uh, the fact that for small data samples, uh, for small data, this uh, the yeah. the MNL outperforms the MC? These are out of sample likelihoods. When you train the models, if you look at the in sample likelihoods, the in sample likelihood of the Markov chain choice model is always going to be smaller than the in sample. I'm sorry, the in sample likelihood of the Markov chain choice model is always going to be better, larger than the in sample of the multinomial logic model. This is the in sample likelihood. The, the test, but okay, then in, the, test. in the sample, we may overfit. When we do testing out of the sample, we may screw up, right? This is okay. like the classical regression picture. So let's imagine that we have these points. Mm -hmm. If I fit a line, it's gonna look like yeah, this, yeah. and I'm trying to out of sample performance, I'll be doing okay. But if I fit a, you know, whatever a six degree polynomial, it may look like this, then the out of sample performance may look pretty crappy. Yeah, yeah. When we will, yeah that's, it, the, that's the same. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so that's purely a, uh, um, a problem of uh, overfitting. Precise. Yeah, okay. okay, I see. I, I see. will think, so. yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. I see. Yes. Thank you. Great. Of course. I have a question about the slide as well. Uh, how many how many products were in the assortment? Do you remember that? Uh, yes, ten. Ten only. Okay. Yeah. Ten. So so ten, which means that you know for the Marco chain choice model, uh, we were estimating hundred fish parameters. Yeah, and more, right? You also need to estimate the yeah, number. 100 plus 10, 100 plus 10, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Yeah. No, wait. In the Markov chain part, uh, you can put the probabilities that a, a customer jumps from the product to the same product to zero, right? Um, you can, but I don't assume that you have prevent that. I allow that. Yeah, yeah. You can, but I allow that. And so we have the full matrix. So that's n squared, if you like. And also we have, this is the rows and we have the lambda vector, that's another n. That's why I said 100 times, 100 plus 10. 
n squared plus n. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, and thanks a lot for the questions. This was very nice and interactive. I appreciate it. Feedback. Uh, so I'll see you hopefully on, mon on Monday. I'll see you hopefully most likely on Monday. Same time. Thank you.